Um, I have too much to talk about. There's probably like four separate talks that I should split off into separate talks. So some of it I might go a little fast. And I'm going to assume all you guys know most of this already. Um, so uh, start like, who am I? Why do, why do I get to have words of wisdom? Well, they're not mostly my words of wisdom. Um, but I have this quote from Herb <laughs> Sutter. This is my favorite quote, as you can imagine. Um, and it's from this email in the committee. And uh, Herb said, Tony's code is righteous. And then he went on to say, and any coding standard that bans it should be dragged through sewage and pilloried. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know, and then he says, I'll stop there for politeness, but I'm holding back. And he goes, okay, one more thought. Seriously, Tony's code follows several good uh, practices that should be strongly encouraged, including all these things. And let's ignore uh, that that was probably talking about one specific small example that I had posted. And let's just take the quote, you know, <laughs> like, like all good movie quotes, you just take the, the um, oh, actually, I, I am hitting next. I just really like the quote. I've got, got this, <laughs> this slide three times. Uh, I also have uh, one from Bjorn. This, this, is, this is what you get from Bjorn in, in emails. It, you'll just, if you said something good in the, in the committee email, it's plus one. I've got like five in six years. <laughs> so I've almost one per year. Um, I also got this once from Bjorn. So I actually got some words. So we'll, come, we'll come back to that one. Um, this is just to, to uh, get your brain awake in the morning. You know, kind of conflicting cliches. Uh, okay, so, oh, how, how am I going to not do audio, but actually play the, the video? Does this work? Yes. Yes, everyone, I don't need audio because you all know what, the, what this was. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's he say here? You, you, you all very close. Copy or copy not. <laughs> there is no shallow. Um, and if we uh, go to Master, Master Stepanov, uh, we want to have very simple things. If you construct something with, with a, another T, say, then you assume those to be equal. Similarly, if you like, default constructed it and then assign it, assignment does the same as construction. And if you have A and B both equal C, and then you change A, then you expect, well, A and B are no longer equal, but B is still C. And this is a very important one. It says that the copies are disjoint, and they're, they're not sharing any data in between them. Because copy or copy not, there is no shallow. And th does anyone know what this, this scene is? This is when he's talking to, to little Anakin at the beginning. I know everyone ignores that the prequels exist. <laughs> Close, yes, what? Something, so, uh, so, yeah, yeah, state, state leads to suffering. <laughs> state leads to objects, objects leads to references, references lead to, to sharing, sharing leads to entanglement, and entanglement leads to suffering. Um, this, this, I think, is all obvious to you guys. Um, now, this, the problem with this, of course, is, you know, programming is a lot about state. That's kind of what our computers do. Um, you could obviously avoid some of it by uh, functional programming, tries to avoid state completely and just pass values all the way through. Um, but the average programmer ends, you know, tends to have uh, state, and then you wrap that state up into classes. And sadly, um, the whole object-oriented programming thing has uh, equated classes with objects, even though that, that, was, that was like mistake number one. Um, classes are, can be values when they work much better as values, but classes become these object things. And, and maybe I'll explain what I mean by objects versus classes in, in a second. Oh, is there any room for copy on right? Copy on right? Y yes. Um, because because it, it uh, externally looks like it, 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 follow, it follows Stepanov's uh, axioms, right? Copy on right is fine, because you, you'll never notice that I'm doing it. And also, along with that, if you have immutable uh, objects, then you can also share stuff because they never change so you'll never see that problem of of you know distinct things so immutable like pointers to immutable objects act like value types or reference to immutable objects um, yes but all of those things require that you know more about the structure of your program than just the type you want to talk to mark all those things require you know more about your structure of your program than just the type yes i will maybe try to touch on that um, 
And once you have objects, you tend to have relationships between the objects. And then we start getting into what is the structure of your program. Um, and remember that Jedi's should not have relationships. And you know, <laughs> l look what happened to Anakin, right? Like, so, um, and then we get uh, entanglement and suffering, uh, and that's the path to the dark side, right? So, uh, what do I mean by object and value? Uh, the question, my question is, is the Queen of Clubs an object or a value? And by object, I tend to mean things like a button. A button in a, in your in your uh, app is you think of it as an object. It's there, it lives for a long time, it changes over time. It's pressed sometimes, it's not pressed. Um, whereas you think of ints and strings and stuff as, as values. They're kind of, they tend to be either timeless, like the, the, the value 17 is always the value 17 forever. Obviously your ints change in, through the life of your program, but they tend to be kind of, kind of ephemeral where they just are there for a while, then they go away, and it, it's the value inside the int that is important, not, not the int itself. Of course, as soon as you take an int and make it a global variable, it becomes an object because now it has this, this light. Or, or you just take a pointer to an int and you pass it around to people and now everyone are referring to this int that lives for an extended period. And suddenly it kind of has object-like behavior because objects are things that change and, and then are observable and have lifetimes and relationships between other things. And when you have objects, you tend to have pointers. It's like, oh no, pointers. And when you have value types, you have, oh, no pointers. <laughs> this is how I explained uh, C++ to Java programmers, because they only live in this world with, they don't realize they have pointers, but everything's a pointer. And they're scared of coming <coughs> over here because we have pointers. And it's like, no, just don't have pointers. Um, so does anyone have thoughts on whether the queen of clubs should be kind of act, you know, treated like an object in your program? assuming you're writing a game program, a uh, card game, or should it be treated like a value? Because I was writing a card program and I ran into this question. And to me, it, it, it affects like, you, you can take any type and turn it into one or the other, but I, you know, certain things push you in this direction. Like I had the queen of clubs and I thought, or like the card class, and I thought, I don't want it to be copyable because suddenly you have two queens of clubs when you should have only had one, right? And sure, there's cases in the game where you have multiple decks or whatever, but you don't want to just suddenly, you know, have queen of clubs sprinkled all over the place. So I started thinking, well, is it, is it like an object? Because it's, you're, you're trying to represent a physical object. Or, or should it, but on the other hand, it's just like rank and, and suit. It's like two ints. So why isn't it a value? So anyone want to pick a side? Value? You're going to say value for anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes? Oh my god. Everything's an object. I, I, we have to talk later. Oh, wait, wait to my next slide. So, so it's both, right? Because it's immutable. And you just said yeah, it, it, it's also like it's always the queen of clubs, right? Yeah, but you just said but that references to act, act, act like, uh, act like that. Yeah. So, well, you know, that's why I'm, I'm torn. This is why this slide is here, because I, I need you guys to tell me how to write this. Well, that doesn't well, maybe, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, maybe. No, it's, it's not new. Like, there's uh, quite a few like interesting things that have been sussed out from that. Well, yeah, but you can't discern between them. Because, but because it's, it's immutable, immutable, it's it's yeah. everyone treats it as a value because it's always the same, right? But but uh, it it also has it has lifetime and it has relationships because it, it's in your hand, it's it's in the deck, it's where you know where is it inside the game. Movable value? Like almost movable. And yeah, that, interestingly, like, that's the first time that I've seen uh, a family of values that ought to be treated in a move only fashion. A family of values that are move only. Like, yeah. Move only is otherwise just to be enter. Yeah, yeah. Like nine times out of ten. Yes? When we were kids, we had a deck of cards and, and, and you'd lose one, and then you grab another deck and you put it there, and it was like, oh, yeah, I got a queen of clubs. But it actually needs to be a king of clubs. Can you put Mark on it as a king of clubs now. Oh, so it's it's changed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in a real sort of. So you're. Like yeah, you're you're and not only are they yeah. So you're. I have to repeat this. So uh, you know, a real deck of cards. If you miss one, you you take the Joker, for example, and rewrite it to be the Queen of Clubs, and so they're they're mutable. Well, yeah. But then, then you just change the value of your card object. 
Yes. So that's what he's saying, yes. So, so Yeah, like like there's only one there's only one seventeen. Well, read uh, Gottlob Frege Foundations of Arithmetic. There might be more than well. <laughs> I, I'm going to do a talk on that one day. Uh, just because it could be mutable doesn't mean we need to tweak it at like with an assignment operator on it because that operation is rare and you want to spot that in code review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So like you said, I, I, I believe in objects, and, but I, I believe that what's movable is not so much the queen of clubs, but the ability to play the queen of clubs. The ability to play the queen of clubs is movable. Yeah, that's, that's true. Like, to a certain extent, the queen of clubs lives in the deck the whole time. And all you get is some, is some uh, ownership thing, uh, token, should be handed to you. Capability. A capability is handed to you, and that's what you hold in your hand. Uh, there was... Odin was going to say something. Oh yeah, I was going to say if, uh, I mean, in life you can lose a card, but if your program is losing a card, you've got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, for David and people who just like everything's a value, uh, go go watch uh, Juan Pei's talks on uh, postmodern immutable data structures. I had to sneak a postmodern in there. Um, <laughs> And his other one on the most valuable values. And basically, you know, even a program that is uh, full of buttons and things, which you really kind of think is objects, you can think of the whole program as a value, and then the next state of the program is, you know, a new value. And you can use value programming, you know, you can do functional programming, basically, is what uh, his talks are about. Um, for you, for Lisa, <laughs> a universe composed of objects, truth is eliminated. I don't, you know, I don't know if everything's an object. I'll be speaking in Berlin on this. <laughs> All right. I don't know. You have to, you know, I, Satra is not going to be speaking in Berlin, so you, you might win. But maybe Ben will be there. <laughs> um, I think something related is a thing that Sean calls incidental data structures, which if you have, say, a contact, like the contacts in your phone, and every contact has a location, and for some reason location is a separate object, and your contact has a point or two location, and it's like, great, you've got... You know, you think this is an object and this is an object, but really that's your object, right? The, the combined thing is your object. But then if somehow you share a location between two objects, um, this is not two overlapping objects. This is one object. And this is your data structure. And this is why Sean calls them an incidental data structure, because this happens in your code all the time. You've just got code when everyone's got pointers to these other things. and and the data structure is just spread out through your whole code base. No one knows what the data structure of your code base is. It's just people have pointers. No one knows where those pointers are. So what Sean actually says is find that data structure and pull it out of your code base and make it a data structure. Say, this is what the Photoshop document is. It's all these relationships. Encapsulate that into a data structure. And then you can like, now the Photoshop document is a value and you can act on it like a value, because Sean is also everything is a value. Um, so I think you could do that, sort of, kind of, we touched on with the Queen of Clubs. You can say, well, the Queen of Clubs has a relationship to the deck, it has a relationship to the hands, it has a relationship to, to where is it on the, on the table and all those kind of things. So the data structure that you are actually trying to go for is your game state. And, and sure, you still have inside that data structure, you have other sub data structures that you want to keep separate, but you, you should recognize that there is this you know, you are building this bigger data structure. And if you just have it all over your code base, you're not going to see it. If you bring it together into a class, then you can find it. Yes? Well, I feel like there's, I, I guess to me, the thing that sort of sells the, the queen or the value is the idea that um, in a game like Pinochle, uh, you have this, this smaller set of cards and groups of cards. Or, or if you play a Boy Scout and you play with several decks, yeah. right? Um, there's, there's multiple cards, but they could all share the same... Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a card game on my phone where uh, there's an infinite number of cards. So you get plenty of queens of clubs popping up. And yeah, there are cases where you really do want it to be a value and you want it to be copyable. And, but yeah, and I mean, I, I tried one day, I started this because I tried to write a card game. And then I started realizing I want, don't want to write a card game, I want to write a deck of cards so that I can then write any card game. And actually, just like have on your phone a deck of cards, and like because 
I don't need to encode the rules if you had all your friends all had a deck of cards and you just played like you would with a physical deck, but you, it was on your phone. Uh, but the, the other question there is, for, for later, uh, if we all have on our phone a card game and I want to deal the cards fairly and not cheat and we don't have a server, how do you know that I am not cheating in the protocol of how we talk to each other? Blockchain. Blockchain. <laughs> the, the, the easy answer now exists. Maybe that is an answer, actually. I, I ask this question sometimes in interviews, and I tell people, I do not know the answer to this question. So I do not expect you to give me an answer to this question. I just want any idea. Yes? Yeah. And, and what, one, of the best, one of the best answers I got from someone was, do you trust your friends? You don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah. It's like... It's like, yeah, and, and that's true in coding. Like somehow people start having all these requirements on something, and sometimes you have to step back and go, do we really need this? Do we, like, this is going to be hard, so can we just avoid, you know, what's the real business objective or whatever? Anyhow, another one from Sean. Shared pointers is as good as a global variable. And Shakespeare, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Um, I, I sometimes use this example as well. When I lend my car to somebody, I hand you the keys, and, you know, off you go. I'm not still holding the steering wheel as long, you know, with you as well, right? And you could say, well, the car is still a, a consistent class it, object. It, whenever the steering wheel is turned, it goes the right way. The car doesn't do anything wrong. It's, it's you know, completely correct object. But two people holding the steering wheel is a bad idea, right? So that's my steering wheel example. Um, this, these are just to let, you know, like you go to a fancy restaurant and they serve sorbet between the between the uh, stages of the meal to cleanse your palate. These are just here to cleanse your, your uh, mental palate. Does anyone know this, this one? Is it, it's not, oh, wait, why is it not playing? Oh, there it goes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. And he also goes on pulling out his lightsaber and stuff. I forget what he says after that, but it's exactly the quote. Yeah. He's talking about signed versus unsigned, of course. Um, so here's my square root function. It takes uh, unsigned int because I can't handle negatives. Um, and well, so far it returns 17 because I do test-driven development. So, so <laughs> it's, it's correct so far. It's also very fast. It's like second fastest square root. Um, returning zero is faster, if you're wondering. Uh, um, but, you know, I made it unsigned because uh, I don't want you passing negative 23 and, and I'm declaring it up here. It's like, look, don't give me negatives. So, great, this, you know, this won't happen. It's like, well, no, of course that happens. That, that's not a, sorry, that's not a compile error. Like, you can pass negative 23 in here because unsigned int is, has no strong, you know, uh, it's not a very strong type. So if you changed it to some stronger, you know, make, made your own unsigned int, you could make this a compile error by, uh, you know, making an explicit constructor from, from signed, whatever, you know, you, you can turn that into a compile error, but who's going to write their own unsigned int? Wait. I, I'm saying this is my own class that I wrote yeah. that doesn't accept, uh, I, I will like delete the int constructor or something. It only takes unsigned ints. No, at first it's an int. Okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. You have to delete the int constructor. Uh, this is slideware. Like this, I, you know, I haven't put the some of the actually some of the. There's a couple of cases here I actually did put in in Godbolt, but not this one. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another example of using unsigned. Uh, this is, this is a, this, there's no compile a warning at all here. At least the negative 23 into, into square root would give you a warning, potentially. This doesn't give you a warning. Eh, nothing wrong with that code. Yes? No? This is, I mean, we didn't write is sorted at work, but we had another algorithm that did exactly this. It, it had to compare, you know, the next one, so it went th not to the end of side. So this, uh, just goes on forever because this this return when, when it's empty this returns, you know giant number It's not it, it actually never crashed in our program because we never had empty in this case, but 
I still changed it. Um, more quotes from the masters. All these people on stage, go, go watch the talk. I, I've got the time points where they say, don't use unsigned. And the last one is just, is Chandler saying, sorry. <laughs> or someone's asking, why, why, does the, why does size return an unsigned? And Herb says, we made a mistake. And Chandler just says, sorry. And we were reality. What's that? We were reality. We were young. We were, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he also says we were young, which is uh, something uh, Scott often says. Um, so, you know, how do you combat this is you write your own, uh, oh, well, first, I, I had the similar problem of, uh, in my code base, we deal with projectors and cameras and stuff, and we have projectors IDs, which are strings, and cameras IDs, which are strings. So obviously, people are going to mix up projector IDs and cameras, camera IDs. So what I've done is written a strong ID class, which by, you know, this wraps up a string and acts hardly anything like a string because it doesn't want to have any string operators because it's just an ID, it shouldn't change or anything. It just has assignment and whatnot. Um, and net with a tag, these are now two different types. Camera IDs are not projector IDs. And if you try to mix them up, it'll be a compiler error. And if you try to pass just a string straight in, it will be a compiler error. Um, and this is brought to you by, you know, this is a quote by our friend, explicit constructor. Right? So, um, and I have this giant table that I'm working on, and it's gone through the committee once, of when should you use explicit, when should you use implicit. And uh, the, it's a weird table. I, I don't really like the style of it, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, if you look at the, at the bottom, you're trying to decide whether to use an implicit constructor or an implicit cast if you're going the other way whether to use an explicit one, or actually don't do either and have a named function. Like when you uh, convert a string to an int or something, you don't want to cast the string to an int. You would call to int or something like that. Even though, you know, you could, definitely you don't want to make it implicit. Maybe you, someone would say, well, you can make it explicit. It's like, no, no, you don't cast strings to ints. You put a named function on that. So um, the very top most important thing is, is it the same platonic thing? You know, meaning I've got a date class and I got another date class. They both try to represent the platonic idea of what a date is. If they're the same thing, then you're on. Then you can start thinking, yes, I want to maybe uh, cast these two between each other and make it. I might even want it to be implicit. There might be reasons to make it explicit. But you're on the track of these are the same. They're trying to represent the same thing. If you're not representing the same thing because uh, one's a string and one is an integer, and those do not, even if a string can hold the string of an int, uh, they're not trying to represent the same thing. Therefore, you say no to the first question, and you end up somewhere in this category. Um, and you answer all the questions about, like, sort of, is it the same thing? And then also, well, it's trying to represent the same thing, but I lose some fidelity. And then maybe, you know, like narrowing conversions and stuff like that, you might want to make it explicit. And then is there a performance penalty? Because, uh, I mean, vector copy has a performance penalty, and we just say that's fine, kind of because we know the size of the vector and the performance is uh, measurable, like is similar to the size of the vector. But if you had a class where uh, the constructor did something really heavyweight, you'd probably want to make it explicit so it doesn't just happen uh, you know, when you're passing functions along or something. And then you also have to think about whether it throws, whether it you know, leaves kind of a dangling uh, pointers around and stuff like that. Um, code review is an interesting one. Uh, if you need to actually keep an eye on where people are making this conversion, then you want to be able to grep it, which means you want to give it a name, right? Yes? If you're starting from scratch, then uh, you think about string, you're going back to performance penalty. It's like maintaining a pro literal for a string constructor. Would that be, would that be implicit based on that sort of thing? Does that work? Yeah. Um, String, char, char starter string, I don't know. Uh, the, the one that gets me is I, I, for a while I used to think that, you know, if it throws, it probably should be explicit, but like string copy constructor throws, you don't want to make that explicit, right? Um, and it's sort of, it's still along the same size. You, you, you kind of can just look at it and know, yes, that, that string constructor is about the size, you know, it's about the performance is about the same size of the string you pass in, right? So I don't know. This is why this is like all question marks. It's like there's not necessarily uh, easy answers. Um, yes. The, so that, yeah, this is what, this is why this is a hard thing to exp to explain. Um, you have to think of your class in your head. Answer these questions for your class, and if your answer is no, you're in this column. 
If your answer is yes, you're, you're in that column, all right? Um, and it, it basically comes down to if you, you, you only get implicit if you basically answer all of these correct. As soon as you answer something in this column, you, you have to stay in this column. And if you answer one thing in this column, you have to stay in that column. Give or take, you know, maybe you'll let one go, but if you, you, the more you start going into this column, that's where you have to live. I mean, given that you're talking about implicit and explicit constructors, you're not really talking about one class, you're talking about a pair of classes. True. Uh, you are talking about a pair of classes. Uh, often, you're only in control of one of them, right? right. Often, only one of them is in front of the committee. And, and we often forget to even consider, hey, did you make that explicit? And somewhere, uh, yeah, the, 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 the one down here, uh, are you sure, is kind, of, <laughs> is kind of, we should just default to explicit. And, and, uh, the, and there's actually some committee guidelines, uh, library guidelines uh, document somewhere that says, says that. Default to explicit and then explain why, if your class says, no, no, this can be implicit here, you'll have to explain it to us. Um, so that's, that's on my, my GitHub, and it's also been in front of the committee once, uh, but it's, it is a hard to understand table. Um, but here's another example that I came across when I was doing that. Uh, if I have an image class that you know, takes a file name and you know, hopefully it's a JPEG or something, it makes an image out of it, you know, then I can construct it like that. And I can also cast it. I can now cast string to image, which I, you know, in, or a static cast, or whatever, but that just seems weird to me. That is just, that looks weird, that should not be allowed, but I can't, I can't get rid of that. Like, that's explicit constructor. You know, you were explicit, you, you, you typed the, the name, but I kind of wish cast wasn't always just, oh, you have a constructor, therefore cast just works. It, that, that feels odd to me, but I don't, I don't think we're ever gonna change that. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, no, it's not clear. It, I look at this as you're like, because I'm the old school C guy, this is like, you're trying to change these bits into those bits. It, it doesn't look like you're constructing an image. You're trying to cast, you're trying to like just, you know, tell the compiler, trust me, I know what I'm doing. This is, this, this string can, can you know, is, I mean, it's not a reinterpret cast, but you know, it could be, because it's, it's C style, it could be anything. Yeah, so. Some languages have constructors with names. Named constructors, yeah, you know, that would, clear up a lot of this stuff, but I don't think we want to go there either, but. I think that's more or less what you want for that one. For that one, yes. I mean, yeah, maybe for this, a factory function would, would have been better, such that, you know, you can't, you have to name it. Because because it's also, it, it's a very heavyweight constructor, and it can fail, and all these other things, right? So, it probably I probably wouldn't make that a constructor. I would, I would have a function that called load JPEG. Also because your image class shouldn't have all your um, I uh, file reading stuff in it. Like that's totally, image class should just hold pixels. I don't have an image class that does this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I have a strong ID type and uh, Jonathan has a strong ID type and uh, John, the other Jonathan, John has a strong ID type and um, the other one is Bjorn Faller has, you know, and there's plenty of them, so go out there and find one and use it. Um, this, this one's there because it reminds me of Herb again. Uh, so, ah, well, I, you know, among all the quotes, some of the quotes I have, I don't know where they came from because this is just an ancient C++ cone. It's been passed down, <laughs> down the ages. So, you know, you've got the student who has this crazy class that just does the right thing all the time. You know, you pass it in, it goes, oh yeah, I'll modify myself to, to do, I know what you wanted and everything. And then the master hammers a screw into the desk. Does that make sense to anyone? <laughs> Cones aren't supposed to make sense uh, at the beginning and I'm not supposed to explain them to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, vector bool is an example of, you know, oh, I'll, I'll be smart and I'll do the right thing, I know what you really want. Um, and, and I just think that's, that, that, that's bad API. Right to to have this class that morphs, yes. I just wanted to note there is a school of thought that screws have threads so you can get them back out. Screws have threads. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the world's best API? Anyone want to? Okay, I I, I was I, I'm expecting someone to eventually say the uh, closing curly bracket, which is a really nice API. All your destructors get called and everything, but it is kind of subtle. So maybe it's not the world's best API. This is the world's best API. <laughs> Every, anyone not know how a hammer works, right? 
if you know anything about physics, and I don't mean you took a course in physics, but you live in the physical world, you can understand how a hammer works, right? It's, I mean, as a, little, a kid, you did have to kind of learn, you know, more how your arm works than how the hammer works. Um, oh, yeah, the, there's, there's the, the, the undo. It's, it's <laughs> comes, comes with that. That, that, that is true, that's... Uh, <laughs> but, um, but it is very obvious how this API works, right? And, and that's just how we should write our APIs. So it's very clear and obvious. If I, oh, I'm going to take this piece of API, and I take this other piece of API, and if I put them together, if for some reason I want to hammer a screw with, you know, hit a, hit a screw with a hammer, don't question me. Don't suddenly go, um, well, so that's, that's where this comes from, by the way. Um, don't suddenly go, I see you're trying to do something with a screw. Did you want me to turn the hammer into a screwdriver? Yeah. Um, and, you know, part of the reason a hammer is obvious is because you can see its implementation. But, like, I don't mean you have to have APIs where it's just like, here's how I work, exactly how I work, so you know how I, you know. But, you know, even this hammer, you can't see what's behind the, you know, what's underneath here. You know, you kind of assume the metal keeps going. I used to do uh, uh, roofing, stringling in high school, university, and it's like, I, I had a hammer just like this where it's really thin here and everything, beautiful. This is the best hammer. It's like, I still have mine. I kept it from the guy who I worked for. It's like, can I have this hammer? It's a really nice hammer. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, you know, you know does, does the metal, you don't need to know everything about how the hammer works. You just need to know the external properties of the hammer, and they have to be obvious. Again, a steering wheel is another example. You don't exactly know, you don't have to look at how the steering wheel is connected to your wheels, to understand it's just a very obvious cause and effect. You go this way, the car goes that way. You know, you could, write, you could make a car where it went the opposite way, you steer this way and the car goes that way, and you'd probably get used to it eventually, but, um, you know. Uh, it's nice when APIs are obvious what they do, and then as a programmer, you want, you don't want, I don't think we're at the stage where we want our APIs to be like Siri, that just, you know, you ask it stuff and it's, it's magically smart, right? You want APIs that are just obvious what they do, and then as a programmer, I will put these pieces together and they'll do the obvious thing that I wanted because I put them together that way. This is one of the analogies. I'll put in the rental steering wheel there. For some reason, all these button modes. And I'm like, I don't know what is what. I mean, cruise control and volume, and I'm, tra I'm pushing up on something with an arrow up, and the car's going faster. And I'm like, I want the sound to be louder. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Modern day steering wheels have a million buttons on them. And, you know, they're no longer simple APIs, right? And they're, they're trying to do, well, that is a case of you now have an API that is doing too many things at once because that is not what the purpose of, that, of this API was anymore. You've just tacked more things onto it that should have been somewhere else. Or it's really useful, you know. <laughs> it's nice having those buttons on the steering wheel. So it's set brother in cards, which was a Lake Harry Corner feature. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a throw, just because you, you just talk to it as a phone. Speak to it. Um, so yeah, that that's <laughs> feature creep on the hammer. Um, anyhow, let's see, let's see where we are. Okay, I'm not going to. I, I, I might get to the end. Um, so you know, obviously the quotes aren't from Ben, but the combination, <laughs> the combination is from Ben. I, I was worried that he's. I'm, I'm now worried that he said. He said uh, this to, to Eva one time, and she's going to like see this and go, "Hey, Ben, were you thinking this at the same?" <laughs> don't don't want to get him in trouble or anything. Um, ah, Shakespeare. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any word which smells sweet? This, there's a the question whether this is supposed to be name or word. It's because there's different copies of Shakespeare that were you know floating around at the time, and people have pieced together Shakespeare. Um, well, actually. This, there's been studies done on this. A rose by a different name doesn't smell as sweet. This has been, so they've gave people various fragrances, uh, either with a, you know, a nice name or introduced it with a, you know, not nice name. And then you were asked to smell it and rate the fragrances and all this stuff. And it comes out, you, you perceived it as less sweet if it had a different name. So programming is not oh, it doesn't matter the name, it'll still smell as sweet, or you know, the, the class will just be as good with a different name. No, Shakespeare was, you know, has some good programming parts to him, but this was one, one where he, he got wrong. Um, I like my quote better. Essence is the essence of naming. Um, 
So I guess there's at least one quote by me in here. Um, I actually have a whole pile of rules of naming that will definitely turn into a talk someday. Um, but uh, essence is the essence of naming. Uh, it, you, so often you have this class, it does some stuff and everything, but you're like, you don't know what to call it. And until you know what to call it, and you go, oh, this class is this. As soon as you get, figure out what to call it, you now know all the, every, ever, every other question about that class can refer back to, well, the class is this. So I can now answer your question about this API. So right now, I, you know, the, the, the uh, thing we've been, been uh, I guess, I don't want to call it whipping boy or whatever, that's a bad phrase. Um, but the thing we've been picking on lately is span in the, in the standards committee. Um, and to me, span has this name, but it doesn't know what it is yet. Because it's like, well, it, it represents these, the elements in, like if you've got a vector, you can have a span uh, that's the, that represents the pointer plus the length of the sub range in the vector or whatever. But then is, you know, is the span just the pointer plus value or is the span the values that it's pointing to? And, you know, what, and so as soon as you start asking questions like what does equal equal do? What does, uh, what does copy do? Uh, uh, what, what can be, you know, what happens when you make the span const? Is the, are, do, does that make the elements const? All these questions, is, and, and currently the span we have answers each question subtly you know, it's kind of like the Queen of Clubs. It's like, oh, I'm half this and I'm half that. Um, and I think uh, if you were to name it spanning pointer, and you'd be like, oh, I know exactly what this does now. It acts like a pointer so that when you copy two of them, it'll be like pointer, it'll be shallow, like everything will be shallow. Like equal equal will be shallow, uh, copy will be shallow. And, and I know because it's called spanning pointer to expect like pointer-like semantics. And then if we instead called it spanning ref, you'd be like, oh, there's like ref-like semantics. At least it's a hint as to, you know, it's trying to represent, it's trying to be the elements that it's, that it's pointing to. So that equal <coughs> equal is deep and it, it compares the elements. Yes? Why not both? Yes, that's the other thing. Well, why not just have both classes and then see which one wins maybe? Um, <laughs> yeah, both, bo well, yeah, we could have two classes uh, that, that are both useful. In, in different in different places, um, I, I prefer one of them myself, but you know we'll get there. Um, th this is my paper I sent to the committee. In exact like, how else do you make diagrams? Um, <laughs> so the question is: Is span regular? And it it, it kind of relies on right right now. Span uh, when you copy a span, it's shallow. It just copies the pointer, uh, the pointer and the length. But when you compare spans, it's deep. It compares the elements that it's pointing to, which can be useful, but it breaks all of Stepanov's rules. And, and all the STL is built on Stepanov's rules. Um, so if you uh, just say, yeah, I know it's not regular, but I like it that way, then I think it should be, it's kind of spanning ref. And it kind of gives you a clue that we all know that references aren't normal in C++. We're all like, hey, references act a bit weird. So you know, that's, a, that's a clue that this isn't what you expected. The next question is whether const is deep. So if the span points to these elements and you make a const span, so think about uh, a unique pointer or a shared pointer. If you have a const unique pointer, the thing it points to isn't const, just the pointer is, is const, the pointer doesn't change. Currently span follows that paradigm where, oh, the span's const, you can't change the, you know, what the span points to, but the elements aren't const. Yet the elements are part of its equal equal. So that means, I mean, do I have, oh, I, I, I missed that slide. So that means if you, if you have a span, it's in this paper here. Um, if you have a span and you, it's a const span and you pass it to a function that takes a const span, when it comes back out, it might not be equal to what it used to be. Because equal equal is deep and you could have changed the underlying things. So I think if span has deep equality, it must have deep constness because it's like logical const. The, the things that you are trying to be are all const. You're trying to say, I kind of own those values. Even if you don't own the lifetime of the values, you're trying to say those values are a part of my value. So if I'm const, then they should be const. Of course, this gets into problems with uh, mutability. The other rule we have in the standard is if you have something const, it's thread safe. And a const span that points to these elements that it doesn't actually own isn't thread safe because those elements can still be changing somewhere. String view probably currently has the same problem. Like string view equal equal, which is also deep, uh, is probably a const function, but it's not really a const function because it's not thread safe. What's your opinion of const iterators? 
constant iterators. Well, yeah, they're, not, they're yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of it comes down to, uh, uh, you know, you're implying a contract with the programmer. It's like, be aware, you know. But some of them are more subtle than others, right? Well, pointers have constant numbers. They have, const, they have star const. Yeah. Yeah, const, const is trying, const iterators are trying to, to pull out. Now, so, if you call C begin to get a const iterator, to a certain extent you're lying because the thing can still be changed. Uh, uh, getting a constant iterator from a const vector is less lying because like, oh, the vector, and you know, const is a total lie everywhere because it can still change by someone else who doesn't have a const view of it. But you know, you're trying to set up some knowledge with the user of like, look, this is const because trust me, it's const. Um, so anyhow, I think this one is really weird if equal equal is const, but uh, equal equal is deep, but const isn't. Uh, and then const uh, deep assign, when you assign a, one span from another span, it doesn't change all the elements, right? It just, it just makes the span point somewhere else. It rebinds the span as if you're rebinding a reference. Um, so even though the value of the span is the elements, when you assign to a span, it doesn't change the value of the elements, which are its value. So that's just me picking on span. Um, if you can't name it, you probably don't know what it is. If you don't know what it is, you don't know what it isn't. If you don't know what it isn't, you don't know what code shouldn't be in it, and so much code shouldn't be in it. This is, this is what, you know, sp this is, span doesn't have this problem, but so much code has this problem, right? Yes? So the naming is not, is it for you, or is it for what you're telling everyone else? It's named there to set almost like expectations. Yes. Yes. The interface is for both. So let me try to answer your question. Um, yeah, a name is for the people that use it so that they have their expectations. And I think both of these names will give you a better expectation than the name span. Span, I'm like, I'm not sure what this does. Um, these, and I still don't know exactly what it does. I still have to read the docs and everything. But you want to be like, you know, hit the road running. You kind of know what this thing does. And maybe you can just look at code and not be surprised by what it does. Um, this, this you will never be surprised by what, you, you don't have to, you know, you can just look at code and know what this does, uses of it. Um, but, but the other half of, sure, the name is to let other people know what it is, but the name also uh, hones in for you designing the class what it is. So that, you know, a month later when you go to add something to that class, you go, no, this is not what that class is. This class is this. So for, for pieces of API you haven't written yet, having a good name means you have a good idea of what the class really is. I'm going to quote you to yeah. you. <laughs> an API is defined by the code that uses it. Ah, yes. <laughs> an API is defined by the code that uses it. Um, OK, what do you mean in, in this case? Well, if the name is for the code that uses your class, then your class is defined by the code that uses it. Therefore, the name defines what well, yeah, see, OK, the, yeah, your, your class is defined by the code that uses it. So if you pick a right name, it'll get used the way you were hoping it would be used. Yes. Okay. And that's how you will implement it. Yeah. But, but conversely, like a, a hashtag is only by the movement of a doctor. You can come up with a name. <laughs> 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 it doesn't matter what you meant to be. It matters what the rest of the world thinks yeah. it should be. A hashtag is owned by the, by the movement that adopts it. Yes. And, and, and that's the other part of like my last talk about APIs. Um, somewhere in there, it's like, whatever it is, you have to live with that forever. Yeah, so, yes? I, I have a coworker who describes it as um, coming up with the, the, the name describes the algebra of the, of the thing. So once you have the correct name, you sort of know how it's used, and it becomes <coughs> automatic. And so if you have the right name, then it gets used the way you want it to be used, and you, you put into it Yes, this is a, yes, this is exactly what I'm trying to get at. Like your words were the, the name describes the, the algebra of the of the type. And 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 yeah, everything else just starts falling everything all your other questions become easy once you've got the right name because you've uh, I, I had a I had a really good uh, developer student that working for me who is now the manager of Adobe Premiere um, in like just a few years, just whew, he's really good. Um, he, but he, he could refactor code better than anyone I ever worked with. And we just refactor everything. And then he'd always have like these base classes called common. 
because it's just like, I refactored it all to here. And I'm like, what is that class? He's like, it's, it's the common stuff, right? And it's like, okay, you don't know what this class is because you can't name it. So maybe some of those things, even though it was common, maybe they don't belong there. First decide what, what is the meaning of this class. You know, having a name, the right name will help you know what the meaning of the class is. And then you'll decide, oh, even though this is common amongst everything right now, it might not be common in the future, so it shouldn't be, you know, here, things like that. I'm sure he learned. That was when he was a young student. It's better now. There's yes? a word that describes the property of affordance. 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 Yes. <laughs> Hammer has affordance and an eggplant doesn't. Yes. Well, to some people it probably does. Yes. Uh, the, the quote here of the, the hashtag is owned by the community that the top leader. Um, I think that I think is really accurate and gets to one of my least favorite naming bits in the air right now. View. Yes. Yes. View. View. Uh, yeah, um, like you, you started with the hashtags get, uh, get turned into whatever the movement follows. View so far in the standard means uh, uh, cons because you can't, you can look at something, but you, you know, it's look, don't touch. That's what, that's what view means uh, in, in the standard now, only represented by string view. It's the only view we have. Um, Rangers are about to show up and they've used view to mean some, you know, to, to have its different meaning and you can modify the things you, you're, you're viewing because like you can see it and then you, and then you go and touch it. Um, the, it's, it's, view is probably not the right name, but seriously, there is no other name. <laughs> because the other important property that we want with a view in the, in the range of sense is that you don't own this, it's, it's elsewhere. You need this like separation quality, yes? const reference. Yeah, well, the, the difference is that it's shorter. Yeah, that is basically it. View, and in ranges, view isn't a, a class, it's a namespace. So you have a bunch of things that are views. So you view colon colon this, view colon colon that. So you want a short name. You know, VU, it's, it's shorter. I don't know. <laughs> views with benefits? <laughs> <laughs> views with benefits. All right. Um, so uh, the number one rule of API design is be consistent because the more consistent you are, the less people have to learn. It just, everything seems natural. Uh, Qt is actually, you know, there's things I don't like about Qt, but Qt is consistent. Once you know how Qt works, oh, does this class have a is valid? Yes, it does, because they all do, you know, or whatever. It's, um, but uh, uh, this, I'm going to mention this consistent warning signs because it's a new rule I've just added in the last uh, year or so. Um, going back to my uh, strong ID uh, class, um, sometimes you do want to get, uh, like I've got a function that takes a string, I can't pass a projector ID in it, but I actually do want the string out of the projector ID. Maybe I'm just printing it out or whatever reason, showing it to the user or something. So I, so I static cast it, right? Which is a little ugly, people don't like typing that. So what people do is they go, uh, takes a string, you know, projector ID dot, and then the IDE says, oh, operator string, is that what you wanted to call? And then they go, awesome, and semicolon, <laughs> they're done. And, and this, was in, this was in our code base. It's just like, it, it gets the job done, and you actually, it actually is kind of like, I know what you're doing, like it's, it is obvious what's going on here. And, you know, an, an at, dot as string would have been a better function, but my, Strong ID class can work on integer strings, whatever, so I can't name the function because I don't know what the type is. So this is like as close as you can get to as string, you know? But I was like, oh God, I, you know, that's, that's not what I want. And, and no one sees, when you do uh, projector ID dot, you don't see this as an option. You know, the, the ID says, oh, maybe you wanted to throw this code in. It's like, no, it only offers you this. So I need a function here for when, yes, I'm going to allow you to get the, get the underlying string. So a function that gets the underlying value of a wrapped type, what should that function be called? If you already know and have gone through this conversation with me, but. Well, like unique pointer calls it get. Unique pointer calls it get. As underlying. As underlying. Just like, because I don't know what it is, it's as, well, whatever, yeah. Unwrapped. Unwrapped, yeah. 
as angle brackets? And does it just not compile if you get the wrong thing, or does it try to convert? Like if I if I have this and I say as int. I say don't comply. Yeah. And half of the time you still have to say template in front of it. Not not half the time, but some of the times. <laughs> yeah. It's only half the time if you write a bunch of template code. Yeah. Outside of templates, it's okay, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, you know, I had narrowed it down to get value, you know, just dot value. Optional uses dot value. Uh, unique pointer and, and friends use dot get um, dot unwrapped. You know, I, I had all these in mind. So why pick one over the other, right? And consistent warning sign is what I wanted. Uh, and it wasn't until, you know, I think it was with you, on, we were tweeting back and forth, and you pointed out that um, uh, like dot value is, is not, a, on optional, is not as scary as dot get on, on unique pointer, right? When you see dot get, you're like, oh, code review, why are you calling dot get on this unique pointer? You're breaking, you know, you're, don't do that every day. It's like, oh, you look at the code, you say, okay, and see why you're doing that, because, you, you know, this API takes, Takes an under, uh, you know, takes a raw pointer, so you have to do dot get on the unique pointer, and, and it's okay because it doesn't keep it. Blah blah. You know, you're not breaking the, the invariance of unique pointer by calling the dot get, but you 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 know, it's a warning sign that you might be breaking the invariance of of, of unique pointer, um, and and it's a warning sign of you are tearing away an abstraction, a layer of abstraction, and that is exactly what's happening here. Is that yeah? No, let me get. You know, I can I can now grep. Unfortunately, get is a really bad name, you know, but to a certain extent you can grep dot get or something to see, and you're just used to looking for it. You know, it's hard to grep the code base, but it's not hard to grep in a code review because you've already trained your eye to see dot get as a, wait a second, I need to take a quick look at, you know, is that okay here? And you look at this case, you're like, oh, I see what you're doing fine, dot get is fine here. But if someone calls dot get on your projector IDs all over the code base, you're like, wait a second, those functions make them take a, a dot, a projector ID, you know, like push push projector ID through the code base instead of calling dot get everywhere. Same with unique pointer. Why don't you make that other function take a unique pointer as well, or whatever the right thing to do is, right? So uh, I think that idea of consistent warning sign is an important idea. Um, standard get uh, has a problem because standard get on a tuple never fails. There's nothing wrong with calling standard get a tuple. You do this all the time. Standard get on a variant throws. So it's like oh, that's a slightly different. You know, it should have a slightly elevated set of, you know, keep an eye out for that. Well, how do you keep an eye out for that, but not for the other one, right? But we called them both standard get. Other bad reasons for calling them both standard get as well, but uh, how they interact with structured bindings and stuff. But someone, people had their hand up? Yes? I was just like, is there, maybe that should be useful in the table, is like, what the variant word mean, and where they should, should have it implemented. What about, uh, I wouldn't say chaining, but calling out uh, how you should use certain APIs by the names that you give it. Like, uh, don't do this. That's the name of a function. Like, it's like, yes, you can do this. And like, it's like, why are you calling? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, once you, it, it only works when you have a consistent API. Once you have a really consistent A, you can be glaringly inconsistent in a case. And, and the canonical case is, is optional, expected, and any all have a dot has value. And it all does the same thing. It tells you whether there's a value inside of, the, of that object because they can be, uh, not, have a, not hold a value. Now let's add variant. Variant has valueless by exception. That is like, do not call me, right? This is, <laughs> it's not has value because, and it's, it's actually the opposite, right? It's like has, doesn't have value, right? It's, nothing is the same between these because it shouldn't be the same. You should not be calling has value on a variant. This, the, Never, never use this function. Maybe in a catch clause you can use this function, but basically try not to use this function because your variant should never get into this state. Um, it's, it's, you have to have move constructors that throw in ugly things. It's not the only case, but it's a rare case and, and you shouldn't have to worry about it. You should write your types such that they don't throw so much and you, you won't get into this situation. Um, I saw hands almost. You're, you're thinking about it, aren't you? <laughs> All right, so this is when Strushup said, nice rule of thumb, by the way. This was somewhat in an email and with the committee, I talked about being glaringly inconsistent with naming. So I got more than a plus one. <laughs> I, I take those plus ones and the, these things and I print them out and put them on my wall at work, right? So people discuss things and I'm like, Strushup said plus one to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Don't, don't argue with me. <laughs> uh, another clash, uh, early bird, you know, you, you guys can look at that. I know what I should, these are, these are for you guys to read while I look at what I'm supposed to be thinking about next. <laughs> and look at wh where we are in time. We're good, we're good with time. Uh, in sooth I know not why I all code so bad, it wearies me, you say it wearies you. So again, like Shakespeare, uh, there's lots of copies of Shakespeare's plays and they kind of get mixed up, so uh, this is from the Coder of Venice. Um, some people have seen The Merchant of Venice, which is, in sooth I know not why I am so sad, it wearies me, you say it wearies you. Uh, which I could also just put up here and I'll mention that uh, the person who says the opening lines of Merchant or Coder of Venice, uh, spoken by Antonio. So, um, <laughs> thus I get to rant now. Uh, and all my experience tells me that the main cause of unmaintainable code is that pieces of code are not kept independent. I don't care about oop, the language, uh, where you put your brackets, whatever. I just care about keeping your code isolated and name things well. Um, which is also goes that other quote about, you know, if you can name it well, then you can know what code doesn't belong. Um, oh, that quote, yeah. Did I, did I already have that quote? Yeah. yeah. Um, right, it's the whole slide. <laughs> it's got the name, the stuff behind it. Um, the other one of these is uh, map. Map is incorrectly named. Uh, <laughs> map should be called ordered map, right? Map, and, and you think, what's the big deal? It's like, but as soon as you call it map, everyone expects every class to just work with it. And also, I swear 99% of the code doesn't care that it was ordered. It's just, I just used a map because I needed a map, and it's, that was the name. Um, but, and same with set, right? You, you have set and you think, oh, I can take all my, my things and put them into a set. And, you know, naively you might even think, as long as I have equal equal, I should be able to put them into a set. Of course, you, you know, you need less than and everything, but um, it leads also to, why doesn't every class just work with map and set? And, there, and therefore, why doesn't every class just have a less than operator? And you know, Herb and I tend to disagree on this point, but I'm like, I can make a chair class that has how many legs and what color is the chair and all the properties of a chair inside a class. And then if we just defaulted a less to just work, then I could say this chair is less than that chair. And I don't, I don't know what that means. It's just like, well, it's less. It's less based on the order I put the member variables or whatever, right? Like I put color first, so black chairs are less than white chairs. Yes? I have a paper out that Walter Brown has you know, uh, gotten behind it that reserves the full ordering for that. Yeah. So you will now be able to have the, sorry, the total order. The total order. Be an arbitrary order that specifically doesn't mean anything. It's just an order. Yeah, yeah. You just want some order. Um, and at one point I tried to get that to be, if you have a map or a set, the de it defaults to standard less. Why doesn't it default to something that, you know, like check that you have standard less or not and then do standard order and there's some kind of ABI problems, but we could just make standard less, you know, okay. const expert if inside of standard less to say, oh, you don't have a less than, I will call default ordering so that now everything works with uh, sets without having to have a less than on, on your class. I'm wondering about that. That was in one of Herb's papers as well because I bugged him about it. Um, but I think if map and set were from day one called uh, sorted or uh, ordered map and ordered set, you, your expectations would, would have been different, right? And you would have also realized that they're ordered and that might be useful. Yes? What were your expectations would be if there wasn't an ordered map? Like, would you have a way to work for every class? Like yeah, it's, a, it's a, like set. I should be able to put any class into a set because it's a set of things. That's what a set is, right? Math, it's a set. When it's an ordered set, then I'm like, oh, my things need to be orderable. You know, the fact that set has, requires ordering is like an implementation detail almost. But particularly, like some people use set, and they use the property that it's ordered, but the vast majority of people don't. They just use it as a set. So uh, to most people, the fact that your, your type needs to be ordered is an implementation detail that's leaking out of the interface. Comparable, which, well, it's not comparable, but uh, at least you can say these two things are equal. So 
Well, well, you know, all all classes that are value types should have equal equal. Um, that 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 we should just we we should generate that, and I'm still going to write a paper someday saying we just generate equal equal for you. Um, so that isn't surprising. You know, what is surprising is that set doesn't need equal equal. It only needs less than. It just you know, if it, if it's not less than or not greater, it must be equal. Yes. Yeah. The value of the thing. Yeah. Set implies equal equals and yes. Plus, there's another problem with map. The name is wrong. It's a partial map. A partial because map. You you say you have a map from int to string, but there are ints that aren't maps. If you don't put every mm -hmm. int in there. You have ints that aren't map. Yeah. It's not a. Uh, yeah. In the mathematical sense, it's, it doesn't map this this uh, domain or whatever to yeah. to whatever that, you know. Man, I was a pure mathematician once upon a time, but I can't remember anything. Um, I can I can let that one go. I, I don't need to call it partial map. Um, I just need you know people just like I need a map from A to B. It it can hold any integer, so it can be uh, uh, closed or whatever the word is I'm looking for. Um, and this is my other rant. Abstraction doesn't need to stop at the class border, which is I see all the time. And don't read the rest of it. Because uh, I will just show you some slides, and this is this is where I get to pick on Jonathan. And I, I will say, you should read his blogs; they're awesome. And I'm stealing something out of his blog, which wasn't the point of his blog. He had a different point. Therefore, his code looks a certain way for a certain reason. But it's when some of this started to dawn on me as as uh, as a, a thing that I should push for. Um, so his question is, if you have uh, an event system where events come in and people want to hear about those events, whether those events are like mouse down or it's like low memory or it doesn't matter what the events are, but you're like, I want to register. When this event happens, you know, call me on a callback, right? There's, you know, millions of these systems are out there. So many of them, when I saw this blog, uh, I thought, hey, I just wrote that a month ago, you know, so. Uh, and here's his, and his is called the event mediator, and that's what, m mine's called mediator, so it's like that close to the, be the same thing. And so the question is, how are you storing these, you want to have, for this event, you have these listeners, right? And you want to either store that as a map from event to, you know, list of, li vector of listeners. When I say list, I mean vector, uh, list of listeners. Or you can have a multi-map. So you, uh, let's start with map of vector. Right, so the map of vector, you find, uh, is anyone listening to this? You get a whole list of people listening. You, uh, if, there, if there's anyone at all listening, you go through the list, right? Very simple code, this all makes sense. If it's a multi-map, then you call equal range on the multi-map because you have multiple people all mapped. You know, we, we have the uh, mouse down maps to this guy, mouse down maps to that other guy, mouse down maps to you know, there's five different entries that say mouse down maps to these people. So you call equal range and then you uh, iterate over the range. I, d I didn't take your, I should have taken your for each one, but whatever. Um, you know, also very simple code. Uh, and and the, po the point of his talk is like, or his blog is, you know, it's slightly structured differently. This has an, is kind of more nested than the other one. And, you know, there's, there's properties and there might be reasons why you choose one over the other, right? But as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, what do I do in my code? And, and think about what is this, this function trying to do, right? It's trying to get the listeners and then call them. So my code gets the listeners and then calls them. This, minus, this is pretty much exactly my code, except for I don't use auto usually, but I wanted to be consistent. And I've got comments in mind because I've got locking that, you know, you should never hold a lock when you call unknown code, right? And it's really hard. I have a whole talk uh, I did here on how to make a listener that can can do locking without without deadlocking, and and my code base doesn't do it the right way either, because um, it's hard. Uh, but this is the same as the other code. But you notice in this code, the question of which data structure did you use doesn't exist, right? I've abstracted away the data structure. And it's like that's all there is. And why don't we code this way more? And you know, I'm like really happy that I, I like, this wasn't a refactoring in my code base. This is just the way it, I typed it 
for, you know, right from the start, just like, I need listeners, and then I need, you know. Um, but then this is also my code. Uh, this is my lock-free code. And this is one giant function that, that does lock-free stuff. And lock-free is one of those cases where it's like, man, I need to have everything, all the state in my head at once, because like, I have to keep track of what's going on. It's really complicated. But when I gave that uh, talk again this year, I said, no, I should really follow my own guidelines and write it like this, right? So this is push now. It's like, find the tail, try to write to the tail. Uh, the only reason you have to loop is because it's lock free and you might not, even if you found the tail, it might not be there when you go to write. So that code is the same as that code, but this one you can understand, right? And I've broken down, this is, this is all that code pulled out into separate functions, right? Now, this, this is easy to understand. So I'm very guilty, as we all are, of writing code like this, and we should be writing code like that, I think. <sighs> okay, this, this one's from Phil. So, does everyone know this, this one? No? This is prequel two? Three? Okay, well, what, what was going, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're smarter than this? That's, that's, Anakin says we're smarter than this? Or no, sorry. Obi-Wan says we're smarter than this because they've been trapped in the force field. And uh, Anakin says apparently not. Because <laughs> they're trapped in a force field. Right? Two great Jedis somehow, you know. Of course, they've got the Chancellor there. That might be the reason. Um, so why, why, why are we in this state? Like, I think we're all smarter than the way we code, but apparently not, because the code I see, the code I write, not just, you know, I'm as guilty as I, all of us, the code I write, um, and we have some, we have some uh, reasons or excuses, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, the obvious time crunch, you don't have time to write good code. Um, I think instant gratification is a big problem, right? You want to write some code and see it work as fast as you can, and you just want, like, you want to see, especially when you're doing <coughs> UI code, you're just like, Get that UI up and running, and oh, I can see it. Now I can like play with my code by clicking on buttons and stuff, and like I see the code happen. Um, and I, I feel like there's this 80-20 rule going on, right? Everyone knows like the first 80% of the code, and then you, this tw last 20% takes the second 80% of the time. Um, and to me, that is like, not that I run marathons, uh, I, I can't even walk a marathon, but um, you know, marathon runner, runners talk about hitting the wall where it's like you've been running this marathon and now suddenly you're just like, I cannot go on. And I feel, that's, I feel this way sometimes when you've written code and you've got, I've got this code 80% done. It's like, there's only 20% left and you're like, oh my God, I've put so much work into this and now I've got this, and I know the last 20% is going to be the hard 20% and you're just exhausted, right? You're just like, how do I, can, how do I keep going and keep going at a high level of quality? You're like, screw the quality, I'm just cutting corners now because I need to get this done, right? It kind of goes back to time crunch. Sometimes when you're writing code, the first 80% doesn't have much of a time crunch, and it's the last 20% where suddenly you realize. And I think we also have this thing of like, we all know what, you know, we see some good code, and you're like, oh, that's, some, that's, that's nice code. Actually, we actually kind of ignore nice code, because it's just like, you read it, and you, you move on, right? But, and, and we know what wrong code looks like. You can look at code, and you're like, oh, that's ugly. Um, but we don't always know what the right answer is. So, you know, we're, we're, we live in this state. And even if you have a kind of an idea, like this might be the way I want to do it, you're like, is that going to be the right way two years from now? And it's like, you know, so sometimes you're, you're just uncertain about, should I put the effort into writing this well? And I'm going to say, yes, yes, you should. I, I worked on a project one time when we were like six months behind and we're like, darn it, we need to cut corners. We need to just get this done. And then six months later, we're like tripping over all those corners that we cut and we still, we're still not done. And we're just like, why did we do that? Like we, we just made our, our lives worse. So often that, you know, for now is, is already getting your way. Um, After Effects team has a, has a macro uh, that they, if you're, if you're cutting a corner somewhere, you put a macro around it that's, uh, you know, if def around that block of code and it's if def ship only once. And as you get close to release, ship only once is true. After release, it becomes false. After like a month after release, ship only once turns to false. All those things that you shipped once, you need to fix them before the next release. And when you look upon presented a uh, constant expression based approach where you can do a to do. To do. And a date. And a date in a constant date. expression. Yes. 
Nice. So, so. After that date, it doesn't come back again. Wow. How do you get the date at compile time? Time macro. Time macro. That, would, that is cool. I like that. Just. <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be that day and you've got a sev to and you need to get a patch out. Well, all you're going to do is change the date. Yeah, change like, the it, <laughs> it's just going to... It's an unrelated bit of code. But you're just going to change the date on that code. Like, you know that's what you're going to do. <laughs> but at least if you keep doing it, you, you know, eventually like it keeps popping up, it keeps bubbling up to the front. Unless you're just like, one day you're just going to go. So you're, what you're going to do is you're going to push it forward three more months or six more months. You're like, Oh my God, we just need to three months, three months. And then one day you're like, we've pushed this forward five times. Either you delete it, the, the, the guard, or you're like, five years. Let's fix this in five years, right? Don't underestimate the ability to develop a blind spot. The ability to develop a blind spot. You're just like, you're looking at it, I don't see anything. Like, what are you talking about? I don't see well, yeah, it depends whether it's a warning or an error, too. Yeah. And, and I think the After Effects one first turns into a warning and then turns into an error. Yeah. I, I, I fight the battle of getting rid of warnings in my code base because we're, we're at that state where there's too many warnings, so I can't see, I can't see the, the important ones. Um, and and I, I do it, it's like one project at a time. I get all the warnings out, and then I turn warnings into errors. And it's like, okay, this one's going to stay clean. And then something changed. Like, we changed the compiler or something, and like we had to like turn back to warnings again. And like, oh, God, I have to start all over. Um, so, but I do think we're smarter than this. Uh, so what can we do? And I think pair programming is one of the things that helps write better code because, you know, you get tired and you just want to get this done and write the, the short thing. And the guy beside you is like, come on, you, you can, you know, write, write this the right way kind of thing. I haven't done a lot of pair programming, actually, but it's, it's from what I understand, it, it can help here. Um, and the, the, the sprint versus marathon, it, it's like, I don't like the word sprint because if you sprint and sprint and sprint and sprint, sprints are good in the sense that they take this big thing that's going to be hard and they break it into small tasks and then you can feel like you're making progress and you can you get positive positive feedback that you know successful sprint successful sprint. But if it's called a sprint and you're supposed to be sprinting, you can't sprint that long, right? You cannot sprint a marathon every week. You have to. So uh, you know maybe it, sometimes you want to make it a relay where you're like, I've been working on this code for a while. Hey, can you work on this part for me? And I'll work, like even just, I'll work on what you're working on and you work when I'm, because you shouldn't have more than one guy working on the code base anyhow. You shouldn't be the, you know, don't get hit by the bus and no one knows the code. Um, so sometimes it just helps to have uh, uh, someone else, you know, working with you. You can pass the baton for a little while. Um, and I think this, this, it, this whole thing, I think, comes back to positive feedback. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's the instant gratification gives you positive feedback and that's why we tend towards it. And, and taking time and writing good code often gets unnoticed. Because um, like if I showed you, the, you know, my code of, of my mediator, you would just look at that code and go, okay, yeah, I understand that code, and you'd move on. You don't go, oh, I really like that code, right? You just, you only see bad code, I mean, especially in a code review. You look through some code and you go, oh, there's a spot that I need to talk to you about. So I've been trying to consciously, especially as, as one of the senior people on the team, one of them does a lot of code reviews, consciously look for, hey, I like that code. Just Here's positive feedback. I'm glad you spent the time to make this nice code. And then maybe you'll write more nice code, right? Like, it's simple psychology. Um, and uh, writing tests can do that, right? If you write tests as you're writing your code, you feel a sense of accomplishment. It's like, I've got all these tests that pass. And then I write another API, and it passes some more tests. And you feel good about it. Um, and, and even, especially, it doesn't have to be the managers and the senior people, but anyone. Just praise public, like, you know, in a group of guys, we, we have daily stand-ups, and we often have someone say, you know, I was working on this, and so-and-so helped me on it, thank you. Just, that's it, five words, right? That's not even praising code, it's just praising, helping each other. Um, but it's, it's infective, right? I, or infectious, whatever. Uh, it's effective and infectious. It's effective, infective, something. Um, uh, and so our team works that way now because it, it's, it's gotten the positive feedback that you know, helping others is a good thing, so let's do it. So you can do the same thing with just like, hey, I saw so-and-so's code yesterday. I really like this thing they've done. Right? Um, and you know, if we have to, let's start like gamifying. You know? So-and-so removed the most code this week. He gets a prize. She gets a prize. Right? Um, and I think I have this thing about visualization, uh, like athletes try to visualize themselves, you know, jumping over the high jump or whatever before they do it. Um, and, you know, imagine the code base you want the world to have or whatever. Imagine the coder you want to be. Um, and uh, I have to have a Bruce Lee quote. 
Um, a goal is not always meant to be reached. It often simply serves as a thing to aim at. So it's like, don't look at the finger. Look at where the finger is pointing. Um, yes? No, I don't do gamification, <laughs> but maybe I will start. Yeah. Um, have we ever? We do some weird things sometimes, so maybe we have in the past or something similar. Um, but this is how I try to write code. I try to look at our code base and think, well, in five years from now, I would like our code base, you know, our code works with, uh, and this goes back to naming as well, our code works with projectors and cameras, and we have a design from the user where the user said, I want, you know, this is going to be four projectors and each one takes up a quadrant, but they have to be overlapping somewhat so that you can blend between them. And you design how you want it to be. And then someone sets up four projectors that aren't pointing where you ask them to be pointed. So you've got your design or the theory side and you've got the reality side of where the projectors really are. And our job is to turn theory into, into reality and make it, make it look right. Um, and, and then we also have, uh, we use the cameras to, per to perceive what the projector is projecting so that we can see what reality is and so we have perception. So I'm like, let's name our classes reality. We have the reality classes that have projectors and cameras inside of them. We have the theory side that is just what the user wants. Our code base doesn't have this right now and we're not gonna have it for like five years or whatever, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but every step we make is going in that direction. We're like, remember that this is our plan and, and every now and then someone's working on something and say, like, hey, that is the start of the reality struct, you, right there. Just make a, don't make a fancy, because we started doing, some, we, you, when you start designing, it's like, oh, reality is gonna be a base class with some abstract functions and we're gonna have like different, because we do different, we do 2D, we do 3D, so we might have different ways of sensing reality. Um, I'm like, oh yeah, and I'm like, no, no, just make a struct, call it reality, put a, put a few things in it. Don't, that's it, just start, small and, and, and also then don't stuff everything into it, right? Don't just keep piling stuff in and don't have every function take reality as, a, as, a, as an input. Take the pieces you need out of reality. If you need projectors, take the projectors out of reality, pass them in. Um, but I try to code in a direction, right? Um, okay, so there's all the cliches. What's the real meaning of these cliches and the, the clash of the cliches? What's that? Ambiguity. Ambiguity, yes. And, and also, you know, I just gave you a bunch of advice. You know, the opposite advice is sometimes also true, right? <laughs> so, you know, take all advice with a grain of salt. Um, and I think that is the end of the talk.